My name's Katie Stallman. Uh, welcome to today's MIT Press Live event, which I'm going to be hosting in the place of Hannah Nyron, who is our usual host that is taking a well-earned break. Um, we're really looking forward to this new series of MIT Press Live events, which will have lots of our wonderful authors from all over the world talking about their books. But today, I'm very glad to be joined by Sethi Endevados and Matt Harvey, who are the authors of Maid Merlin's Unsolved Mathematical Mysteries, which we published in July 23rd. Uh, Matt and Sethian, where are you both calling in from today? I'm calling in from Wise, Virginia, which is a small town in the southwestern corner of the state of Virginia. Um, and I'm calling in from the other side of the US from sunny San Diego. Brilliant. Well, it's fantastic to have you guys both online. And I think a real uh, privilege of being able to do this MIT Press Live series uh, with me in our London MIT Press office, you guys uh, in California and on the East Coast. Now, normally I would ask you a little bit about what you're doing at the moment, uh, but it is August. Most of us are on a bit of a hiatus. Um, so instead I'll say, uh, what have you got lined up for the fall and how is this year perhaps a bit different from uh, what you'd be gearing up to in the fall normally? Well, uh, I'm getting ready for uh, an, the fall semester of classes. Uh, actually, tomorrow is our first day of classes. So I'm excited about that. Um, we are doing in-person classes. So I guess that's the same as usual, but it feels different. Um, so uh, that's, that's the, the big thing that we're, we've got going on. We've got uh, to learn sort of how to handle all this technology, sort of simultaneously delivering to uh, in-person students and online students. Yeah, Katie, we've gone fully um, digital, fully online. Um, research just ended for me in the summer. It was just this, <laughs> so much fun, this amazing program with some students that we were able to get some new results on. Um, but schools, we're already in the second week of school. So school has already started for us because we have a short and condensed semester. And uh, I think the thing I miss the most is what it means to be human. <laughs> I'm always used to seeing my students in person. And once you kind of get to know somebody in a physical way, then even if they call you on the phone or on a webinar, you, you get used to them. But if the only way to meet them is digitally, it's really, it's really difficult to establish a culture and a relationship with them. So that's what I'm trying to figure out the best way to do it. I feel you there, Sethi, and I think um, as much as we really love doing this series and it makes a lot of our events open to way more people all over the world than they normally would be, uh, one of the things I miss most at the moment is uh, being in bookshops and being able mm -hmm. to do proper author book launches where uh, the authors can sit in front of an audience of friends and family and people who are interested in a topic and uh, hold up their book and talk about it and discuss it. Um, so we look forward, hopefully, to being able to do that again one day. But for the moment, it's really fantastic to have you guys online with us today. Thank you. Um, now, I want to get us to the topic of this uh, MIT Press Live event and also really the topic of the book, which is math. Um, and it always feels a little bit like the elephant in the room um, because lots of people uh, don't like math or think they don't like math. Um, and many of us struggle with math, even uh, if it's something that people are good at, it often becomes a bit of a means to an end, uh, a sort of way to solve a problem rather than a process um, and a discipline in and of itself. Um, but I don't think that's the case for you. Uh, let me, do you mind if I jump in, Matt? No, no. Yeah, the, my way of thinking about math is this notion of playfulness. And I think even when I was telling you about my research this summer, it is such a joy because I got to play. And the way I think of it is um, kind of an analogy is to Legos. You know, when you kind of buy the, the Lego sets, sometimes you buy a, a kit of like a Lego house or a car or a space shuttle or something. And it's great to follow those instructions and make the model that somebody else has thought of and, uh, and kind of enjoy its beauty. But the real joy comes in kind of breaking that set apart and trying something else or mixing sets together. And like, what happens if I take this house piece and a car piece and make a train out of it or this cool creation? And, and that's how I think of math is it's great to learn some subject about algebra or geometry or you know, calculus or whatever it might be from junior high all the way through. But the joy is not about, to me, is not about learning about what somebody else did, but for me to create my own stuff, to put those pieces together and get a really a chance to play. Yeah, and it's interesting. I also sort of think of math in a, I guess, as a kind of a sculpture. Um, for, for, and for me, the 
sort of the beautiful thing about math is this sort of intricate sculpture that that it that it is, I guess, this edifice of uh, incredible complexity, but also beauty. Um, and as a as a student and a learner of math, that for me is just sort of joyful to 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 wander through the parts of the sculpture and to appreciate sort of the the interconnectedness of things, the way that things sort of are are the way they are because they have to be. Um, and that's really appealing to me. Yeah, it's interesting, Matt, um, just to riff a little bit, but we're talking about like discovering versus creating, right? For you, you're looking at it as like this thing that's there and you're discovering more of it. And for me, it's sort of like building and creating new things that's out there. Um, Katie, if I can just jump in and say one other thing, you know, I one of the reasons of the book and one of the reasons close to our heart is this notion of math and access. You know how you're saying math is very much of a, as an intimidating thing to many people or having, you know, their hearts have been broken <laughs> through math for some reasons. But in the world today, math is truly a, a gatekeeper for so many things, especially for the STEM disciplines, for science and technology and engineering. And uh, and we have to be a little careful about how we can excite and bring people into it and not deny them access to so many things that the world allows through through the lens of math. Well, we're going to talk a little bit about how your book does that and makes math more accessible. Um, but before we do that, I'd like to talk a little bit about the journey of how the book came to be. So why don't you start by telling us your personal journey, how you ended up uh, teaching math in the first place? Uh, for me, uh, looking outward, it would look like a pretty, pretty straight line path, but I think uh, that's maybe not so accurate. I, initially, I was not um, particularly enamored of math. I gradually came online with it um, through some good teachers in middle school and high school, um, and then in college and later. Uh, but throughout that whole time, I've really been interested in a lot of things. I think sometimes people have a sense that uh, people that like math, that's like the thing they're good at. And uh, they set everything else aside. And uh, at least in my case, that's, that's certainly not been true. I, I've always been interested in so many things um, uh, from, from my earliest days until, until now. Uh, including math. Math is one of them. <laughs> and, and for me, I, I, I was told as a kid or just was raised up as a kid to always get a PhD in something. It's like fourth grade. You know, when we, when we grow up, we're not, we're not expected not to go to fourth grade after third grade. We kind of just do it. And so for me, I had to get a PhD in something. I just chose math as something I thought was okay. I really didn't fall in love with it until I was creating my own things for my PhD thesis. And then I started, then I just absolutely loved it. it I realized also recently, um, maybe a few years ago, that I don't just like creating math, but I love talking about it. I love, going back to your question about teaching, like I love building these beautiful Lego creations, but I just also love, you know, talking to an imaginary audience. When I was like, I think 10 years old, I would just talk to a room of nobody after I built this cool Lego truck and say, oh my gosh, check out this amazing truck, four wheel drive, you know, nobody was there listening. But that's what I realized is like, I love to make new things, but I also would love to get people excited about it and make them fall in love with the same things I'm falling in love with. And so I think this book is a little bit of the reflection of how Matt and I feel about getting the world excited about these things at the edge of knowledge. Now, Matt and Sathya, you wrote this book together, but um, how, how did you meet? How did this collaboration come about? Um, let me jump in, Matt. Um, Good. For us, we were, I knew Matt just as a grad student. He and I are mathematical brothers, and that means we both have the same PhD advisor. Um, and I was, I think I graduated a couple of years above Matt, uh, earlier than Matt did. But in fact, our advisors who the book is dedicated to, the person who's kind of influenced the most, and he is incredibly creative and, uh, and just a lovely, joyful person in, in many ways. But um, I reached out to Matt for two reasons. In the math world, I'm known as somebody who likes to draw and you know my, my research is very visual and, um, and beautiful pictures. But in the art world, I'm known as an idiot. Like nobody knows who I am in the art world. Like I'm just like, who cares? We don't know this guy. But, uh, but Matt is one of those rare people in the math community who would critique my work, who I would turn to and he would say, well, I, that sounds great to you, but really it's not that good. So he is a, he's truly an artist in many ways. And I think you kind of heard that about his interests. Like he, he touches so many things about what he, what he loves to do. And he can push me on these graphic illustrations and he can also really keep me grounded in my dreams. Even you could just hear by the tone of our voice that I'm the most, you know, everything is the greatest and the happiest things in the universe. And Matt is like, let's be a realist right now. You know, there are things that are hard in life. And so I need somebody to ground me and to make sure that these problems I think are gorgeous. Matt might say, well, actually, I don't think that's as beautiful as you think it is because the world might not see it through your lens. 
That's awesome. So a great team then. Um, yeah. let, let's get uh, to the book then. Um, what was the vision of this book? Why did you guys decide to write it? Um, let me jump in, Matt, for this thing, and then you could uh, you could jump in later if you want. But one of the things that I fell in love with is how is again this joyfulness of unsolved problems. You know, if, if you think of a road uh, that has been well paved and you're going on a hike uh, or you're going um, going on a bike ride or a car ride. One of the joys is kind of to go off-roading, is to find a waterfall that nobody's been to or to find that corner uh, of, of a lake that nobody's seen before, right? It's great to go to well-marked places and enjoy things that people have done, but man, wouldn't it be awesome to be the first person to see something that nobody in the world has seen before? And to me, that rush, that rush of being at the edge of the unknown is is the main reason for me to write the book you know katie if you think about music you can think about the works of beyonce or you can think of adele you know like these amazing singers and songwriters um that are that are wonderful if you think about history and you could think about the most cutting edge historical things or biology and dna protein folding and even issues of covid and how to do this thing almost any field you can kind of feel what the edge of the unknown is you can see what groundbreaking work is but if you talk to most people about math and say what's groundbreaking you know, they say things like the Pythagorean theorem, or the quadratic formula or calculus. These are, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of years old. So how do you take somebody to the edge of the mathematical unknown so they can actually peek over and look at the edge of the unknown and and play with those kind of things? That's what motivated us to do it. Yeah. And just to jump in there really quickly, um, <clears throat> you know, I think this was a, a vision of Sethians from the very start. Um, was, was this idea that these, these kinds of questions are accessible to uh, all the audience. And he had to sort of bring me on board with that at the, at the outset. I was maybe a little, you know, oh, well, come on. Can we, can we really uh, explain this unsolved problem to uh, the average Joe? Um, but, but yeah, I think these, these, are, these kinds of questions are accessible to everybody. And that's, that's really wonderful to, to think, you know, these, these are questions that nobody can answer, but anybody can wrap their head around. Mm -hmm. well, that's fantastic um, and that brings me on really nicely to kind of uh, the story of the book because I think that is one way in which you guys have made this not only an accessible book but also one which is fun and interesting and keeps people engaged. Um, now as people might be able to guess from the title and what they've seen of those sample pages, um, the book is kind of set in uh, King Arthur's Camelot. Um, with uh, the characters of Merlin um, and other members of the round table kind of thrown in. Uh, why did you choose this theme to illustrate the concepts that you're talking about? Um, let me jump in, Matt. Um, the, the theme in, in one sense is artificial. It could have been a story about Star Wars or space or adventures in different worlds, but what we were really intentional about, Katie, is that we did want a story that brought these problems together, that we didn't want it to look like a math book, that, you know, here's exercise number one, and here's problem number two, here's chapter number three. We wanted it to be story driven because we know that's what people love. That's what that's what excites me about things. That's what the things I remember the most in college and in junior high and in high school are these cool stories that have happened in my life. So. We picked King Arthur and, you know, Excalibur and the Knights of the Round Table. I think we have Sorceress Morgana, the Holy Grail, the Lady of the Lake, even the death of Arthur and his burial. All are here as a story driven thing because we wanted to, you know, tie all of those pieces together somehow into kind of a forward moving narrative. Yeah. And, um, <clears throat> you know, part of the choice was we needed something that was a little bit outlandish, you know. <laughs> In a sense, because our problems themselves are a little bit outlandish. I think mm -hmm. lots of times when people approach a, a math question or something, they, they sort of instantly approach it from a very pragmatic point of view. Like, well, okay, so here's a question about an army. Well, what's like, what's a large army, you know? Well, we didn't want to have that kind of sensible kind of approach to these problems. We wanted something, uh, you know, extraordinary and so crazy. The, yeah. yeah, Merlin and King Arthur, Camelot, that seemed to fit that sort of um, exuberant sort of sense of things. Wonderful. Well, I think it was um, an excellent choice. And actually, I'm not sure I've even told you guys this, but I did my master's thesis on uh, the Mort de Arthur, which is uh, the sort of the essential uh, Camelot myth. So I was particularly excited to see that it was getting cool. a bit of a 
a bit of a revival in this book. Um, now, one character within this book is a bit of an interloper uh, in this kind of classic Camelot story. Uh, will you talk a bit about your main characters and what the inspiration behind them was? Mer Merlin uh, is the main character in the uh, in internal story, the Camelot part of the story. And, um, you know, we chose him because he's sort of reputed to be sort of mysterious, brilliant. You know, he has sort of all this sort of characteristics that we want of somebody that could sort of address these mathematical problems and sort of uh, embrace them. Uh, and so we, we sort of tossed all of the hard problems at him. So he's the internal character in the story. One of the problems that we noticed, which I'm sure you know, Katie, as you thought about this, is that Camelot is such a patriarchal world. There are almost no women. I mean, there's Guinevere, who is kind of this person who jumps around between Lancelot and Arthur. But if you think of the Knights of the Round Table, if you think about Merlin, if you think about almost any of the you know uh, these great characters of Lancelot or Percival, and even Arthur and um, and, and the crew, there are no women. And one of the things we wanted to make, especially if we wanted it to, to be an inviting book, is we wanted women to be sort of the center of the story. But how could you do that if it's patriarchal? And, and the way we did it was um, we have a narrator to the story, a person who, is, who has found the journals of Merlin. Uh, Merlin has, you know, uh, has written these journals of problems he couldn't solve in Camelot. And this character has found the journals and her name is Miriam. We give her the name Miriam. And it is in honor of um, a woman named Miriam Mirzakhani. So in, in mathematics, there's no Nobel Prize in math, uh, but there is something called the Fields Medal, which is the highest honor you can get as a mathematician. And unlike the Nobel Prize, when you win it, usually when you're like 98 and about to fade from the world, you have to get the Fields Medal before you're 40. So it's kind of the gods of the mathematical world who have transformed mathematics at a very young age in early parts of their career to make an amazing impact. And in the history of the Fields Medal, I think it was started around the 1930s, no woman has ever won it except one. There's only been one and it's the first and the only woman and her name is Miriam Mirzakhani. And she won it, I think at the age of 37. And by the time she was around 40, I believe she passed away from cancer. So just a few years later, it's incredibly tragic, but we asked her family if we can use her name to honor her. And the great thing about Miriam, Miriam Merzikani, the actual woman who lived, is that she loved to draw. She loved to doodle and she had such a playfulness to math that it was the perfect person to kind of honor for us. So the stories interweaved where Miriam introduces uh, kind of a problem and then you see Merlin's journal. And then she kind of comes back at the back end and tells you the state of the art as a mathematician about what's going on with those problems today. And that's awesome. I'm um, so exciting in such an imaginative way um, of creating a world where crazy things can happen, uh, but you can also work out some of these seemingly impossible problems. Um, and I mean, the book itself, um, I don't know uh, how many of our audience have managed to already get their hands on a copy or who have downloaded those sample pages. Um, if you've just joined us um, a bit late, then if you look in the chat, um, there is a link and some instructions to, as to how you can get hold of those sample pages so you know what we're talking about. Um, but it's very, very uh, beautiful and fun. Um, and it, it's really quite an object in and of itself. And I think most of the people who watch our events are quite keen on books generally. Um, and not just kind of the ideas and the narratives and the stories they represent, but the physical books themselves. Um, and I think that is something that was really important for you guys too when you were making this book. Can you tell me why uh, you think that uh, physical books are really important, particularly uh, at a time where our lives have become like hyper-digitalized overnight? Yeah, well, I think there's some, some real value in just being able to physically, tangibly hold a thing in your hands. And I think it also encourages people to sort of play around with these problems in a way that maybe when you're viewing something digitally, you, you can sort of skim through much more quickly. Um, I can tell you my experience in sort of working with some of these problems, a lot of them I didn't really know anything about before, you know, we, we sort of dug them up and started working on them. Um, but <clears throat> for, ex for example, one of the problems we, uh, deals with something called a thrackle. And it's something I'd never heard of before. It's sort of a very twisted up, knotted object. And 
I, I didn't ever really, uh, you know, I didn't pursue the, the unsolved problem at all, but just simply the act of trying to draw these thrackles is just incredibly uh, fun and frustrating at the same time uh, uh, to try to create a, a, a nice looking thrackle. And so it's just an experience of, you know, dueling, getting your hands into something um, and, and physically working with physical objects as you're doing this. It's very appealing to me. Yeah, I mean, from a philosophical sense, uh, which I've, which has motivated me, you know, Martin Heidegger, this philosopher, he talks about how he hated the typewriter when it first came about because it actually pulled you away from handwriting. What handwriting is like what it means to actually express your identity to somebody else. You know, I'm thinking about, you know, your father or your your parents or your grandparents handwriting like a handwritten letter that comes to you and how valuable that letter is to you because you could kind of get their tone from like exactly how it's written out. Malcolm Gladwell has this beautiful uh, writing on how how wonderful paper is and what we can do about folding paper and writing paper and kind of playing around with paper. So um, I think actually a colleague of mine just wrote to me and he said, how did you get MIT to publish such a gorgeous book? Like, how did you convince them to make it not just pretty in terms of the way you guys have designed it, but physically the printed copy and then the hardcover and the pages are just incredibly beautiful. So we hope that the beauty of the book actually instills the joy of actually sharing the beauty of math that, that you know, that the book asks us to think about, so. That's awesome. Thanks so much, guys. Um, and just for anyone um, who's having a little bit of a problem with the chat, um, if you go on the MIT Press website um, and search for Mage Merlin, um, I know that particularly if you're on a phone, uh, that can be a bit hard to have both going at the same time. Um, so search for Mage Merlin on our website and underneath the cover, uh, you'll be able to download those sample pages. Um, now, guys, we want to leave lots of time for questions, and we've already got some questions in the chat, which is brilliant. Um, we'll move on to those in a second, um, but this is a book full of puzzles, and so it'd be really weird if we uh, didn't have a little um, look at some of those puzzles before we moved on to the Q&A. Um, so um, would you guys be able to give us like a little bit of an introduction to what we can expect from those puzzles? Yeah, let me take a crack at it and uh, maybe Matt can give us another one or if we want to mix it in with the Q&A time, that, that'll be fine too. Uh, but here's one of my favorites. And we're, the book is actually very visual as Matt was talking about. So the puzzles range from images to patterns to pictures and, and also to numbers. But since, since Katie, we're all kind of fooling around with a very digital medium right now and not a physical book, I thought I'd just start with something about numbers. And I think it'll be easier for the audience to catch along rather than share an image together. But here's one of my favorite puzzles, and this is the last puzzle in the book. This is uh, Merlin's last puzzle that was given to him by the Lady of the Lake. And the puzzle goes like this. Um, can you predict the future of numbers? That's what the puzzle's about. And so here's the way it goes. If you give me a number, I'm only gonna give you, I'm only gonna do two things to it. One is multiplying and one is dividing by two. So if you give me an even number, I'm gonna take that even number and divide it by two. But if you give me an odd number, I'm gonna multiply it by three and add one. So if you take an odd number and multiply it by three, it stays odd, but if you add one, it becomes even. So for, for an example, like if you give me the number like, um, like three, it's an odd number. So three times three is nine plus one is 10. Now it becomes an even number. Now that it's even, 10, you can cut it in half and becomes five. So now it becomes odd. And then five times, which is odd, so five times three is 15 and you add one and you get 16, which is even, so you divide it by two, which is eight, which is even, so you divide it by two, which is four, which is even, so you divide it by two, which is two, which is even, so you divide it by two, which is one. And it turns out this number three, you know, it's like those uh, kind of Plunko machines that kind of like drop down and eventually kind of land in a spot. And it turns out this number three kind of like plunks your way down into the number one, eventually lands at one. And every number, every whole number that mathematicians have tried and computer scientists have tried always lands at one. And so no matter what number you pick, it like do, 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 kind of bounces around with a simple thing. If it's even, you divide by two. And if it's odd, you multiply by three and add one. That's it. Multiplication by three or division by two. That's all I'm doing. And it kind of plunks its way to one. And here's the question. Can you think of a number that doesn't plunk its way to one? Can you think of a number that like does something else other than one? And we've tried tons of numbers. Of course, we haven't tried all of them because there are infinitely many and infinity is massive. So either convince me there's a number out there that plunks its way to something not one or convince me that every number goes to one. And 
it might seem like a silly problem, Katie, but this problem mathematicians, in fact, Paul Erdős, a very famous mathematician said, this act, the problem itself is from the 22nd century. Like it's so hard and it's, although it's so easy to describe, it's so hard that it doesn't even belong in our century. We don't have enough tools to even make a dent in this beautiful, magnificent thing. And so it's such a playful problem, but you immediately come to the edge of mathematical knowledge. Matt, do you want to, do yeah, we have yeah. time to give another one, Katie, or I don't know. What... Yeah, go for it, absolutely. Okay. okay. So uh, one of the problems uh, we deal with is, is, is deals with something called, uh, what's often called a perfect brick. Uh, in, our, in our book, we describe it as sort of a way of def uh, arranging a, uh, groups of soldiers into square form formations. Uh, but what it is is essentially a generalization of the Pythagorean theorem. Um, so the Pythagorean theorem, which you probably learned in, uh, in your school days, uh, says that if you have a right triangle, the, the sum of the squares of the two legs adds up to the square of the hypotenuse. Uh, and in some triangles, in, in most triangles, you can you do this, you get some, some non-whole numbers. Uh, but there are certain triangles where all three of the numbers, the two legs and the hypotenuse, are all whole number lengths, like three, four, five is the, the smallest one, because three squared plus four squared is nine plus 16 is five squared, which is 25. Um, so this has been known for, for a long, long time. Um, and there are many generalizations of this kind of a problem. So one, for instance, is uh, Fermat's last theorem, uh, which was, is no longer unsolved, it was recently solved, but that takes it in a different direction in terms of higher powers. But our problem deals with, uh, instead of just having uh, two numbers that square up to a third perfect square, we want to know if you can have three numbers where any three uh, whole numbers where any two of them squared added together makes a perfect square. And also all three of them squared added together makes a perfect square. So it's real simple in some sense, because all you're doing is you're taking whole numbers and you're squaring them and you're adding together and seeing if you get a square or not. Um, but to date, we don't know if there are any numbers that satisfy those conditions. Yeah, both of these things give you a very numbery flavor to these things, but the book is really cool because it has a lot of pictures and a lot of images. So though lots of different slices of problems, but we thought this would be kind of fun to share for audiences who don't have a physical copy or, you know, can't actually see those images along with it. So that's fantastic. Well, thanks so much guys. Um, we're going to turn to the Q and a now in the chat. I'm just putting some instructions about how to use the Q and a, uh, for those of you who haven't used it in the past. Uh, but it's pretty simple. You should have a little Q&A widget at the bottom of your screen and you can just type a question in. Uh, the great news is we already have some questions. Um, so we're going to dive right in with those. Um, but do keep them coming, everyone, uh, even while you're listening to answers to other people's. And um, just to echo what um, Sethian and Matt said, um, you're only going to get a little bit of the book if you uh, just come to this event and hear them talking about math in such an excited way. Um, if you really want to dive into the problems, uh, do get hold of a copy. Um, you can go to your local independent bookstore and ask them to order one, um, or you can get it off your favorite online retailer. Um, and it's a, a great option for anyone who um, is homeschooling as well. If you've got um, kids who um, really want to spend some time at the kitchen table, uh, away from their screens, uh, pushing their brains, uh, this is a really great option. Um, or for those who are older and want to do these things as well. Um, so let me start off with a question um, about the book which says, um, would you have dynamic systems, differential, uh, differential equations, for example, discussed in the same approach as you wrote for this book? So I think um, that's a question about, um, you know, obviously this is a book of puzzles, but do you think that you could take the same approach to dynamic systems and differential equations? Uh, let me jump in, Matt, especially because I talked about that last problem. Um, so that problem that I told you about taking in a number, dividing it by two, or taking a number, multiplying by three, and add one, that is a very discrete way of talking about dynamical systems. So dynamical systems and chaos theory, all of these ideas talk about what happens over time. You know, as things keep changing, can you predict the future? Um, of what's going on. And the problem that we posed is a very simple, discrete dynamical system. Instead of talking about a whole leaf transforming, we're talking about one number and what's gonna to happen to the number three over time. And so 
even in that straightforward method, you get to really difficult things. And one of the things about dynamical systems in general is that there's a notion of approximating a solution and getting a perfect solution. So you can think of approximating it through a differential equation or a PDE or actually getting the perfect solution and actually solving this. And that itself is a subtlety. And what we want to do with this book is that's what Matt and I worked really hard for is to find a set of problems that are accessible to anybody. And that's also clear. So sometimes the problems, there are a lot of, I mean, there are so many there. I'd say we know 2% of math out there compared to the 98% of the problems that are open to us. So we had to kind of dig through and pick the problems that weren't about these subtle things, but were really clear to the reader. You know, as you were talking about Katie, you sit down at the kitchen table and you're working through it. I want, I want, you know, Matt and I were all are excited about getting everybody understanding what it is that you're trying to show. And so I think a bigger theory of dynamical systems with using the powers of calculus and beyond would be too much for a general reader. But the flavor of those ideas is what we wanted to get across with this last problem that I talked about. Yeah, and if I could just uh, throw in like, so my instinct on this is always to be pessimistic. So my first answer is like, nope, no, you can't do it. But doing this project has really made me appreciate more you know, you have to be really creative about how you approach these things, but there's a lot more that can be sort of geared towards this level um, without making, in my opinion, significant compromises if you're careful. Awesome. Um, great. Um, well, another couple of uh, questions about the problems in the book. So someone has asked very simply, how many problems are there in the book? Uh, I think there's 16 of them, right? Yep. Yep. 16 problems. So lots to get your teeth into. Absolutely. Um, and then um, we've had another question um, about um, that kind of final problem. Um, so when you encounter an elegant problem, like the ones in your book, uh, what is your first response? What are the first steps you take towards understanding it or solving it? Matt, do you want to go first on that one then? Think about it or? Yeah, well, okay. So my first instinct is usually honestly to try to construct or work an example you know something that illustrates the property so for instance with Sethian's uh 3n plus 1 problem you know it's easy pick a number see where it goes you know and in some sense that doesn't of course that doesn't answer the problem but you begin to get a sense of, of why you know where, where the problem is okay um in the case of the uh pythagorean uh uh, the perfect box problem, you know, what I did was I just started trying some numbers to, there's like several conditions that have to be met in order to get this perfect brick. So I asked, well, can I come up with um, some numbers that meet two of the, or three of the four conditions? Um, and sort of like, you know, I think I even wrote a little computer program to try to find those numbers. Um, so that's, that's, that's my natural instinct is to get my hands dirty by doing some examples. And that's one of the reasons I really wanted to work with math because he's willing to get his hands dirty. I'm on the other side. I just run away from them. I look at these problems and I go, oh my gosh, I get it. There's no way my skill set, which is so limited, has anything to do with making. Matt's just, you know, he's all, I mean, although he's a realist and even you could say a pessimist in some sense, he's willing to roll up his sleeves and kind of be faithfully diligent, like I'm gonna try this thing and see what happens. Whereas my op the only reason I can be an optimist is because I avoid all the things I suck at. So I look at a handful of these problems, I'm like, oh my gosh, there's no way I know about numbers. But a few of the problems Katie has to do with images, like one has to do with peeling oranges. Like if somebody gives you any box, like an Amazon box that you get, of any shape of all these kind of flat sides and instead of just having you know rectangles and squares, what if somebody gives you a beautiful present made up of 300 triangles and pentagons with these flat sides? Can you take a knife and like rip that box open and peel it so it lays flat without all the flaps overlapping each other? Like, is it possible to do that? And that problem is actually motivated by Albrecht Durer from 500 years ago. It's one of the oldest motivated math problems there is. It's really simple. It's about unfolding boxes and laying it flat. That's all the problem is. Now that I get excited about, right? Because I love to draw. My work is on geometry. And so I don't write a computer program on Pythagorean theorem stuff because I am really terrible with numbers. So what we wanted to do with this book is to get the entire spectrum of mathematics, which goes from things like chaos theory and differential equations to images, to geometry and shapes, to numbers and to formulas. And 
it's such a rich uh, family of weird cousins and aunts and nephews that we wanted everybody to get a taste of it. And that's why we picked all of these problems to get a, get a slice of it. But in terms of my excitement, I would maybe just fall in love with doing and working on just a few of them, just knowing that my gifts aren't there at all and for the rest of them. So. So moving on, um, well, I'm kind of developing a little bit on that question, actually. Um, do you think that the playful ways of thinking that you've developed as mathematicians have changed the ways you approach other fields or subjects? Um, and what ways, if so? Um, I'll take a crack at that, and then maybe, Matt, you could think about it. Um, but one thing that I think, going back to what Matt had said, which really echoes with both of us, is that we, neither one of us, fell in love with math as a kid growing up. It was one subject in many, and we loved many different things. And so for me now as a professional academic, my title is actually a professor of applied mathematics. And to me, 20th century, Katie, if somebody says applied mathematics, it usually means differential equations or wind turbulence or you know, dynamical you know, fluid design and motion and for engineering. But you know what, in 21st century, everything is applied mathematics. If you want to think about numbers, the way your credit card is encrypted when you swipe it at a coffee shop, it's using prime number theory. And so it's, it's all about applied mathematics. The way you want to talk about your DNA folding in your body and the way proteins are you know, folding and giving mad cow disease is all about geometry and applied mathematics. Almost every subject, even, even logic, you know, the theory of mathematical logic, the foundations of logic is now getting into artificial intelligence and issues of what it means to be true or false in our world today. And how do you verify something like that? So to me, the playfulness of playing with these unsolved problems, I can bring and work with, with artists and architects and engineers and scientists. For example, right now I'm thinking about the sonnets, Shakespearean sonnets, there are 154 of them. And I want to know how they're related to one another, not from the way the words are written, but from the way they're sounded. Like if you actually read a sonnet, how is one sonnet related to another one based on sound? And so immediately you have an unsolved problem because nobody's at thought of that, or maybe nobody's cared about it, but that's fine, right? You have to go places that it's, you know, you kind of scratching around things that you're interested in, but that curiosity of one leads into curiosity of other things. And again, I'm only going to play with things that I'm good at. So I'm going to think of sonnets visually because that's how I think. So that that's kind of how my curiosity goes. Yeah, I've been thinking of, of this while you're talking. I don't have a good answer to that question. That's a good question though. Um, I think there's just so much value in sort of having a, a, a child, sort of a childlike approach to a lot of these, these things that we face, you know, I, I, I am guilty of being overly serious a lot of the time. So, um, you know, the, to the extent that I can sort of look at something that's actually in my profession, math, and not be so serious about it, it's, it's actually very refreshing. Yeah, I, I just want, also want to, Matt is a very humble person. That means he's also a very faithful person, which means that he would only do things that he's going to carry out and do to the end. And so for me, I'm like, I know nothing about sonnets. Let's do it. You know, on the other hand, Matt's like, all right, I got to read, you know, I got to spend a year actually like honoring Shakespeare and sonnets before I'm, I'm going to say those things in public on a call. But it doesn't matter to me because, you know, that's who we are. So he is, he's a, you know, he's a very faithful, devoted person. You could talk to my wife about my failures later after this talk if you want to. So there are weaknesses of being an idiot like this. So I was thinking earlier um, yeah. when, when you gave that analogy of, of sort of going off road and I, and I was thinking in the back of my head is like, there's a, a beautifully curated trail past all of these <laughs> wonderful sites and you're just going to wander off into the weeds. What do you <laughs> yeah. I think you guys are a great team for exactly uh, this reason. Um, uh, now talking um, as Matt did about sort of a, a, a a playfulness and kind of an almost childlike um, joy in these things. Um, what what sort of would you say is the minimum age or stage uh, that um, someone would have to be at to, to really enjoy this book and to be able to start grappling with it? Um, you know, would a third grader be able to get something out of it? Uh, how would you recommend approaching this book with children? Um, I'll jump ahead and Matt, you could you can um, think about that for a second. But, you know, I have a, a daughter who is uh, going to be in fourth grade. So she's she just finished third grade. And I also have a son who graduated college a year ago and now he's working in Boston. And I have two other kids in between somewhere in there. But the point is that, you know, I have the spectrum of, of kids. I would say 
if you want to hand this book as a gift to somebody for them to play with, then I would think of it as junior high in that range, sort of like sixth grade in, right, and, and above, something like that. And it depends on where you are in the world, right? Plus, you know, kind of the educational systems. But, but I would certainly do a lot of these problems with my third grader and fourth grader, but me with them, right? Cause I'd sit at the dining table and I'd be curious about it. Like, oh, I wonder how we can do this for a box. Or if I take this structure, I wonder how that works out. Let's draw that out. And as Matt is saying this playfulness, I want to instill that joy into them. So instead of saying like, here's a book, read it on your own. Like, I want to say like, hey, play with me. Like, these are kind of cool things I'm interested about. So I think the problems, many problems are accessible at all age ranges. But in terms of this independent learning, I think the curiosity, I'd say junior high is my guess. What do you think, Matt? Yeah, in terms of the actual mathematics, like what you would think of as like mathematical prerequisites, very low. You know, multiplying, pretty much that's about it. Uh, adding some fractions, I think, comes up here and there. Um, but but there is more to it that's a sort of a, a not so obvious sort of requirement, so some, some sort of maturity of, of, of uh, your ability to think about those problems. But I, I really also don't think it it hurts to get exposed to stuff before you can really grasp it. So yeah. One thing just to echo what Matt is saying is, you know, some of the problems say things like, I know this works for these three pictures, but does it work for all of them? And, you know, that's a very sophisticated question because somebody might say, oh, it seems to work. You know, I've gotten it. But the question, all of them is a huge way, right? That's a mature way of kind of thinking, oh, how do you know it's always going to work? Ooh, and then that gets the brain kind of thinking. So now, when, when I was a kid, uh, somebody told me about the, the four color theorem. You know, which says you can, if you have a map, that you can color it with four colors so that adjacent countries are a different color. And I didn't get it. Like, I was like, well, nobody solved this. Like, give me a map. I can knock that out like in an afternoon, you know? <laughs> so mm -hmm. I, I didn't have the sophistication to understand, hey, this is something that we're saying happens for all maps, you know, mm -hmm. not, not just the one that you happen to have in your hand. <laughs> but just the idea of thinking about coloring a map was probably good for me. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I love that idea of um, either giving a young person something that is like a little bit above them to challenge mm -hmm. them and to give them something to aspire to, or doing it with them to give them a bit of an introduction um, and get them thinking uh, perhaps in different ways. Um, now, we've had a few people say, um, are you planning a sequel? And indeed, if you are planning a sequel or would like to do one, um, and our editor, Jeremy, should uh, hopefully be listening to this if you are, um, what would the story of that be? Have you got any more ideas up your sleeve for that? In one sense, I mean, Matt and I came up with a thousand ideas with a thousand covers with a thousand titles and we pitched it to ourselves and to MIT and a lot, you know, it kind of went through a lot of work. And I just want to say a shout out to Jeremy, who was just phenomenal in terms of really valuing what we cared about and being faithful to it. And coming out with just an incredible product at the end that we just are, are in love with. Um, but in terms of a sequel, I don't think that's our interest right now because one, the book just launched. And also we wanted to really um, trans, we wanted to see a need for it. Like the reason we wrote the book and most of my colleagues are writing to me saying, I have never seen anything like this in all of academic life, right? Even in the trade world or in the academic world, a book like this where anybody can walk to the edge of knowledge immediately with every problem in a turn of a page is amazing. And so we're thankful for that. But unless there's a need for a sequel, unless people are just getting bored of this book or, you know, these kind of ideas, I don't, I personally wouldn't, want it. In fact, I'd be thrilled to say, you know, if you like these things, there are a thousand other things all over that exist anyway. So find a mathematician, find a friend and fool around with these kind of problems. And I don't think you need to buy another book for it is what I, is what I would say at this point. But if there's another need, I think, I think we can go with it. So Matt, man, what are your thoughts? I don't know. Like you, this is just like, you know, we're just getting sort of this one wrapped. So I'm not thinking beyond that right now. Yeah. <laughs> I there are a, we left a lot of good problems on the sort of the cutting room floor. Just things. absolutely, this doesn't fit in. We can't figure out how to do this in a way that we feel works. You know, there, so there's tons of good stuff out there that is not in this. Um, but uh, I'm not thinking that far ahead. Yeah. Well, my um, my other thesis was on Robin Hood, so maybe you can bear that. <laughs> uh, for, for if you ever get to that stage. Um, now, um, we've had someone who would like to read a little bit more about the Jira-motivated unfolding boxes. 
Um, could you either talk a little bit more about it or direct them to somewhere to go to learn more about that problem? Yes, um, that's close to my research, actually. In fact, this past year, Matt and I worked in the summer on unfolding objects in higher dimensions. So instead of just unfolding boxes that you take a 3D box and you lay it down in two dimensions, why don't you take a 30 dimensional box and lay it down into 29 dimensions? And so if, since the Dura problem is so difficult, we just decided to change the problem. And that's what mathematicians do, right? Oh my gosh, that's a hard question. I'm gonna change the question, Katie, to another question that I might be able to answer. And so that's what we, that's what we try to do. But the beautiful thing about these problems is that they motivate all of these other ideas that come from it. But in this particular question um, for the listener, Katie, there, if you just type in Durer uh, conjecture, you will just come up with tons of you know, uh, explanations and, and places to find it. And, I'll, and Wikipedia is a good place to start at least to get a feel for it. But I'll tell you what motivated Durer in the first place. And if you take, um, like here's a polyhedron, you can kind of see if I, if I hold this kind of weird shape in front of me, it's called a sociohedron, one of the most beautiful polyhedron that ever existed. But you can see that some of these angles, um, because of the way the perspective is designed, the angle, like this doesn't, this might not look like a 90 degree angle to you because of the way it looks. And Durer was this Renaissance painter who wanted to preserve angles perfectly. And he knows if he's drawing a cube, you know, it looks like there's this focal point at infinity that's going to warp all the angles at 90 degrees that it won't look like a 90 degree corner. And so he's like, how can I express in a two dimensional painting this beautiful 90 degree corners of a cube without doing this perspective design. And he says, oh, I have an idea. I'm going to cut the cube up and lay it flat. So it kind of looks like a cross. You know, you can like fold the cube of the cross up of these squares into this cube. And he's the first one to think about drawing and communicating ideas from 3D into 2D in a very clear way. You, you give up the cubeness, but you get the angles. And so that's his motivation. And he came up with something called the Painter's Manual, one of the most amazing and influential works on geometry in existence that is not in print at all. I'd love to get that book in print. I think it was written in German and I'd love to get it in print. Um, I think it existed once, but that, that's a great place to turn on these beautiful images that Dürer came up with and asked a lot of uh, wonderful geometric questions in the Renaissance era. Amazing. Um... Someone has asked, which I think is a brilliant question, and actually maybe more inspiration for SQL. Um, why did you choose unsolved problems? Why not solved problems? Um, Matt, do you want to take a, or I could correct. What do you, what do you want, man? Well, uh, <clears throat> I mean, I, th I think you can maybe get a sense uh, of Sethian's enthusiasm is for the, the unexplored territory. Okay. Um, and, and, and that it's just naturally appealing, you know, to, to be able to say, here's a question that we don't know the answer to. Um, you, like us, don't know the answer to this question. Um, I think there is a lot of, of beautiful, like, like I said earlier, there's a lot of beautiful math that um, we could approach in this kind of a way, but we, we wanted to do something that was like headed towards that frontier of the unknown. Yeah, and I also want to say, you know, there are two approaches to kind of encouraging and teaching mathematics for those um, who are in the margins, who are struggling or have had a bad experience. And one is to say, hey, you know what, Katie? I know you think you're a bad mathematician and you think you're bad at math, but you're great. Trust me, you're good at this. That's not the approach I take. Although I'm an optimist, I don't take that approach at all. I actually say, you know, Katie, I know you think you're bad at math and I just wanna come alongside you and agree that you are awful at math. Mm -hmm. But then I also want to say the next sentence, which is, but so am I. You see, in the beauty and the most amazing, glorious thing that math is, I feel like it's almost like um, um, Mount Everest. And you're at base camp. You're at the floor of Mount Everest looking, saying, how can I ever do this? And I'm three feet above you. Okay, I have a PhD and I've written papers and I do research in math, but I'm just three feet above you. So compared to the glory of math, we're both idiots. And so we wanted to encourage the audience by saying, listen, I know there are these solved problems that people have done that's wonderful and they're beautiful ways of doing it. And they're amazing books written, by the way, on solved mathematics problems. It's gorgeous. But in terms of unsolved problems, nobody has taken this seriously to bring, it, to bring everybody to the edge of, this, of the frontier. And what we wanted to say is, look at these problems. It's a kid's problem. Like a third grader can understand this problem. And yet nobody in the history of the world has been able to solve it. We're all idiots. We're all fools compared to this glory that's math. So why don't you play the game? You can't possibly fail because nobody has succeeded. <laughs> like at the end of the day, you're going to be as good as the best, right? And maybe as Matt is saying, by you fooling around with it 
and playing around with it, not just you might be able to solve it, but come up with a different problem that's exciting or think of a different approach that might be a useful tool for some other thing related to a different field, even about sonnets or even about art or music that might motivate and inspire you. So that's what looking at the edge of the unknown does. And that's why we really wanted to do this book. Yeah, and, and you know, I guess it doesn't really seem like it sometimes, but math must be really good at publicizing its, its successes because, you know, most people, they think, oh, calculus has, you know, solved all the problems. And so what we wanted to really highlight is, no, no, there's so much really basic stuff that nobody knows the answer to. Which is, is, so there's, there's a lot that's still sort of low hanging in some sense, not, not easy to solve, but a lot of stuff that's not been solved yet. Yeah. Awesome. Um, I should say that um, while you guys were talking, um, we had someone in the Q&A say um, that they never knew um, that Jira inspired deep mathematical research and could MIT Press investigate republishing his writing? So I have passed that request on to uh, one of our editors as well. Um, and I very much hope that will be possible. Um, now we're drawing to the close now. I've just got a last couple of questions for you. Um, and I thought this was a really interesting one that kind of... Um, takes us away from the book into math a bit more broadly again. Um, what role do you think math plays in the academy? Um, and is it as similar to the sciences as many people assume? You know, I'll say a little bit about that. And that's actually related to this unsolved question stuff. One of my favorite things about um, being a mathematician and thinking of mathematics in the academic life is the way you um, sign your name to papers. So in the sciences, in biology or chemistry and physics, the last author of a paper is the person who owns the lab. They're the person who has gotten the grant to have this million to $5 million project going on. The first person who signs the paper is the person who did the most work. And so it's written not according to alphabetical order, but in terms of who's the richest and the most powerful and whose lab it is versus who's the one who's committed the most to the project. And there's like this, a grad student kind of fits here and there's a postdoc and undergrads and there's a whole power struggle in terms of who does what. In math, it's really simple. It's al always alphabetical, always alphabetical. And it doesn't matter if you're the person who spent 30 years on it or the person who spends three minutes on it. Because you know what, Katie, that th those three minutes might be exactly what's needed to get over that hurdle. That's exactly what's needed to kind of push through to that next level. So that 30 year problem might just have just sitting on the shelf had been that person for that three minutes. So I loved mathematics as this even playing field that anybody can come and make a contribution and not be thought of as a second class citizen, that you don't need anything to play the game. You could just jump in and contribute to something that people have been thinking about for, you know, tens to hundreds of years. Yeah, I have a kind of a different answer to that, but maybe get to the same point. Um, <clears throat> You know, there's, there's obviously like such an interplay between the ideas of math and science, you know, math is the language for science and science feeds us so many interesting things to think about. But I've always sort of pushed back against the idea that they're that closely wed. Uh, for me, like a, a key distinguishing feature between math and um, science is, is the scientific method. You know, that's the, that's the, the central pillar of, of science, scientific method, and yet that's not how we solve problems. Mm -hmm. um, and so to me, it seems like what we're actually doing is, is in many ways very different from them. Yeah. That's brilliant. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to use this uh, as an opportunity to wrap stuff up now. Um, thanks so much, guys, for answering our questions. It's been really fun. Um, I should Say as we end that um, all the way through that event, um, my phone was blowing up uh, with people saying how much they were enjoying uh, the event and how much you were reminding them um, of why they um, love math and find it really exciting, um, including my husband who um, said, oh my days, these guys are the coolest, um, which I think we, we should probably add that he is also, he did a math degree. Um, so this is very much his cool part. Um, but it's been really exciting um, to get to talk a little bit about the book with you and um, I think just really inspiring to think about how um, it's not always about getting to the solution um, but uh, engaging with these problems like right on the, uh, the edges of human understanding is uh, in and of itself worthy to aspire to. Um, and so that's what the book's all about. I really hope um, that anyone who hasn't already got a copy goes and buys it. Um, 
you uh, can look in the link as well, uh, in the chat as well for a link to um, our website, um, which um, will tell you a little bit more about uh, some of the events we're having. You can also just Google MIT Press Live and you'll get a whole list of events we've got coming up later in the season. Uh, our next one is on visual culture, um, which uh, is gonna be really fun. Um, Slightly different, but actually uh, remarkably, I think we'll cover quite a lot of the, <laughs> the same themes. Um, also do, um, if you're able to get out and buy this book from your local bookstore, ask them to order it in. Uh, we really want to support local bookstores because they've right. been really badly hit um, by COVID and by having to shut their doors for so long and uh, by still um, you know, requiring to take sort of important safety measures. Uh, limiting numbers of people in their shops and not being able to host these events themselves. So uh, a big shout out to all our bookseller friends. Uh, we are going to continue to send people your way uh, forever um, because we think you're amazing. Um, and uh, Matt and, and Safian, thanks so much for coming online. This has been really fun. Um, we look forward to um, selling lots of the book in the future. Um, and everyone, uh, whether you are just about to start uh, the rest of your afternoon at work or whether, like me, you're clocking off for the day, um, I hope you have a really great rest of your day and of your week. Thanks, Thank you, everyone. Thank Bye. You.